There are museums for almost everything. But very few know that there is a museum for public relations. This is a passion project based in New York City and curated by Shelley Spector. This year, the museum is embarking on a project to get digitized so those around the world will be able to experience it without having to travel. Shelley has had the good fortune of spending quality time with some of the PR greats, including the father of modern public relations, Edward Bernays. She will be a part of a fireside chat on January 9th as a part of the final day of Spectra. This video that follows will set the tone for that exchange that takes place. The museum is also raising funds from around the world for its digitization project. You may head to prmuseum.org to learn more about the museum and how you can support it. Over to Shelley Spector to share insights that are a treasure trove. Hi, my name is Shelley Spector. I'm founder and director of the Museum of Public Relations in New York. It's the world's first and only museum dedicated to this field. And the idea for starting it came from Bernays himself because he was always, always looking to build up and the reputation and the respect of the public relations field. In fact, I would say that he did more for the reputation of public relations than anybody else. Now, remember at the time that he started the field in 1919, there were only publicity agents or what he would call flex. And Bernays knew that to achieve a certain amount of status in public relations, he would coin the phrase Council of Public Relations. So that was a different way of looking at public relations than the publicity hacks at the time. So when he started his firm, it was the Edward Bernays firm, Council of Public Relations. And then he went on throughout his career to write some very, very intellectual, intense books about public relations. Remember, he called public relations an applied social science. And now we're gonna look at why. So Bernays had a very, very famous uncle, you may know, his name was Sigmund Freud. Now this is a picture taken in the year 1900. So Bernays, who was born in 1891, in this picture was about nine years old. So you can see Bernays here up front. And then in the back, I'm sorry, my head is in the way you can see his double uncle, Sigmund Freud. So this is how it worked. Bernays's mother was Freud's sister. Bernays's father's sister was married to Freud. So you can see the impact that Freud must have had on Bernays's young life as Bernays was thinking about new ideas and, and of course his career. And uh, so as it turned out during this period of time, there were a lot of social psychologists coming up in the, in the field. Of course, we know that Freud is the father of psychoanalysis. Well, at the same time, there were people who were studying the behavior of crowds or social psychology. One such person was Gustave Le Bon, and there were many others who influenced Bernays at a very early stage in his life. Now, one of the first PR jobs that Bernays had was to strengthen the reputation of the United States as it went to war with Germany in, at the Great War, uh, which was around 1917, Bernays worked for the Committee of Public Information. So you can see him all the way to the right. He's standing next to another very famous public relations person at the time, Carl Beyer. So they worked um, in the Committee of Public Information that was a kind of propaganda force for convincing Americans to participate in the war. America at the time was very isolationist and uh, they increased enlistment around the country. They also raised money for a liberty bonds to pay for the war. And then when the peace treaty was signed in 1919 by Woodrow Wilson, Bernays went on to uh, talk about America's greatness. And he realized then that, that what they were doing was not just talking up America and all its great virtues, they were selling an idea, freedom and democracy, and that became associated with the United States. When he came back from the war, he realized that 
selling ideas was really the way to go instead of just pushing products and promoting products. Um, so the idea, the, the idea of using big ideas and his programs stayed with him the rest of his life. And that's why he was such a genius in what he did. He never promoted the brand. Uh, he always attached it with a social purpose. He always used research. And he also always used third party credibility. So he was highly credible at, at this art. So one of Bernays' most famous campaigns or infamous campaigns that he is known for is uh, the Lucky Strike campaign. He had told the CEO of American Tobacco at the time, you know, you're losing half your market because cigarettes are not able to be smoked in the street or out in public by women. And if you allowed it, or if society allowed women to be smoking in public, whether in restaurants or in theaters, then perhaps these women would be buying more cigarettes. So he took women who were already smokers. He didn't convince women to smoke who weren't smoking earlier. So that's a kind of misstatement that um, people uh, have had for, for about a century now. So what he did was he staged a, um, an event during the Easter parade uh, in Easter parades across the country and had hired debutantes to be smoking with cigarette sm uh, holders, walking down the street. And uh, thereafter, with all the women seeing these high status women smoking, they wanted to be able to smoke out in the street too. This was a huge act of defiance to local ordinances. And he created a lot of public pressure for women to be allowed to smoke out on the street or in restaurants. And uh, one by one cities across America um, struck down their ordinances preventing women from smoking in public. Now, what's interesting here is that Bernays never used the term lucky strike in any of this. Nobody knew who was behind these debutantes walking down Fifth Avenue. They just saw it and it seemed to happen just, uh, just by accident that there would be women debutantes smoking cigarettes. And, uh, but if he used the term lucky strike as a part of it, then it would be promotional would not be believable. Right, so it was just the whole idea of women smoking. He attached that to women's liberation. These cigarettes became known as torches of freedom and uh, they were an act of emancipation from what Bernays said was man's inhumanitarian, man's in inhuman behavior toward man and uh, it became a whole social movement. And you know, you look in the context of what period of time this represented, this was right after women had won the right to vote. So this was yet another act of liberation for women. And since Lucky Strike was one of the foremost brands in the country, Bernays really didn't have to use the brand name and the promotions because he, because if people just bought cigarettes, the market share for Lucky Strike would continue to rise. So the sales would rise regardless of um, whether he promoted them by brand name or not. And so he took a very high road approach and just talked about cigarettes in general. And for years, nobody knew who was behind this campaign. And by again, by attaching a, a consumer product like a cigarette with a social purpose of women's liberation, he created a very high level for this campaign he convinced women that uh, by smoking, uh, they would be elevated in social status and also showcase their own emancipation for the rest of society. One day, Mr. George Hill, president of the American Tobacco Company, or the largest, maybe the largest tobacco company extant at that time, called me in and said, we're losing half of our market. And I said, why, Mr. Hill? He said, there's a taboo of men, there's a taboo by men that does not permit women to smoke. 
either in public or even at home. What can we do about breaking down that taboo? I said, have I your permission to see a psychoanalyst? He said, what did it cost? I said, let me ask. So I called up Dr. Brill, who was a, one of the great disciples of my uncle Sigmund Freud, said, what did it cost? Dr. Brill, for me to have a little conference with you on a question uh, that is of importance to the people whom I'm working with. And he said $125, which at today's purchasing power would be about 20 times that, 20 times that. So I went to Dr. Brill and I asked him what cigarettes meant to women. And let me say in parenthesis that cigarettes at that time were not regarded as dangerous to your health because that had not been found out yet. In fact, they were regarded as symbols of manhood. Little boys smoked them to prove that they were older than they were. And they were regarded as symbols of importance in the society giving pleasure and so on. So uh, I went to Dr. Brill and asked him what cigarettes meant to women and he answered very quickly, cigarettes are torches of freedom to women. They want to smoke to dramatize man's taboo against women by not permitting them to smoke and that's why they want to smoke and then he added as an afterthought and they titillate the erogenous zones of the lips here I had my hundred and twenty five dollars worth of knowledge How, what could I do with that information I decided that there were two days of freedom in the United States. One was July 4th, political freedom, but that was no good because people were in the country using firecrackers to celebrate the day. They were permitted at that time. This was some 50 years ago. The other day was freedom of the spirit Easter Sunday and it occurred to me that any young debutante who was aware of the times and of herself as a woman being discriminated against would be delighted to walk in the Easter parade with her bow uh, to dramatize the idea that cigarettes were indeed torches of freedom to and to validate uh, and to invalidate the taboo against women smoking. So I called up a debutante friend of mine, asked her to get another friend and two young men whom they liked, and they I also instructed them on how to give information about what they did to the newsreels, weekly newsreels to the newspapers, to the three important press associations, the AP, the United Press and International News Service, and to walk from 34th Street to 57th and back, it, and back and forth lighting torches of freedom to protest man's inhumanity to women by a taboo against smoking. Next morning, there wasn't a newspaper in the United States. Even the New York Times had a front page story, debutantes light torches of freedom to protest man's inhumanity uh, to women by a taboo against smoking, lighting cigarettes in their walk. The interesting thing to me was that within three days, the newspapers, without any intercession on my part, published accounts 
that women were smoking in Union Square in San Francisco, in Union Square in Denver, and on the Boston Commons. And to my surprise, within six weeks, on their own, without any intercession on my part, the League of Theaters, which had a ban on women smoking in the smoking rooms under the orchestras of every good theater in New York, lifted the ban and women were allowed to smoke. That obviously set a trend and uh, the Surgeon General's uh, statement that cigarettes were dangerous to your health did not come out until about 30 years later. Another of Bernays' very famous campaigns was for ivory soap. And uh, it is interesting because Bernays himself never gave his two daughters baths. He really knew nothing about bathtubs and kids, but he convinced the people of Procter & Gamble that if he could position ivory soap as a way for children to become more creative, that people will associate ivory soap with all good things. And um, so he, again, he did research about children's creativity before he started, and he did not sell ivory soap per se with a brand name, but ivory soap was the only brand that floated. So it was the only soap that could be used for bathtub toys. And uh, he hired these uh, sculpting artists, soap sculpting artists, which became a big thing in the 30s. And they went out to schools and the schools would then purchase cases and cases of uh, Procter & Gamble ivory soap for the children to be able to carve an art class. So now ivory soap is no longer just a soap. Ivory soap has become a way for children to get more creative and something that their mothers wanted more than anything else was to have brilliant creative children. So for 40 years, the soap sculpting contest and the soap sculpting activities was going on in schools and everybody associated it with ivory soap, except Bernays never said ivory soap. Everybody associated it with that brand, felt good about that brand because it enhanced children's creativity, inspired children's creativity and mothers, the nation over loved ivory soap. We worked for Procter & Gamble for several decades. I think it was 30 years. One day the president of the company said, we have bad news. Children hate soap because the mothers wash their faces with soap. The soap gets into their eyes and they detest it. And obviously, if they detest it as children, they'll detest soap when they grow up. What can you do about that? We always make a research and we found that an artist called Brenda Putnam sculpted in soap instead of wax. It was less expensive, easier to handle, no waste, because whatever the waste in sculpting was could be used for cleaning purposes. We then went to psychologists to find out whether children had a creative instinct or creative feeling from the age of four to five up. The psychologists concurred in that. We then suggested to the company that we have soap sculpture competitions each year based on the various categories of ages that the psychologists said were the ages at which children did more or less the same type of creative activity. Within a year's time, 23 million children in the public schools were sculpting in ivory soap and loving it as not only a creative medium, but also 
as a medium for cleanliness, which Ivory Soap said is next to godliness, because it was 99 and 44 percent pure. The competition kept up for 15 years, and it made such an impact that today the competition has been over for, oh, I'd say 40 years. And many of the schools that had it as a competition are now having it as part of the curriculum. And Ivory Soap and Procter and Gamble are still profiting from it. And so is the society because Cleanliness is indeed next to godliness. One of his best known campaigns was bacon and eggs. And you can see the result of it even to this day when you go to a restaurant <clears throat> in, in Europe or even Asia <clears throat> and you're looking for breakfast, they will give you an option of <clears throat> what they call an American breakfast, which is always consisting of bacon and eggs. But how did that whole thing come about? Well. It was again through Bernays's genius of associating bacon, which we know to be not particularly healthy, as a health food. What he did was he created surveys to go out to doctors. And this again was the first time that public relations ever used a survey for publicity purposes. He created a survey asking doctors if they agreed that a healthy breakfast was better for people, especially people who are going to be working at intellectual jobs. And they, you know, for the most part agreed that a big breakfast was good for your health and your mental abilities. And um, he also included a question of, do you think that bacon and eggs represents a good breakfast? And they all agreed to that. So now he puts out the news that bacon and eggs uh, according to doctors, is a big breakfast, and families across the country started serving bacon and eggs. But again, he never used the, the name Beechnut. The Beechnut brand was not included because, again, Beechnut having the biggest market share was going to benefit if everybody just bought more bacon for their households. So it was, uh, you know, very clever and, you know, yet another use of. Uh, using third party endorsements to get the credibility, using authorities, right, for the doctors and not using the brand because he did not want to appear promotional, but also taking a consumer product and attaching it with a social cause, in this case, bringing forth greater health to your family. And there were even uh, situations where if a family down the street started eating a big breakfast of bacon and eggs and the kids were getting A's in school, you know, that created peer pressure among families. So he knew that psychologically, that mothers who were in charge of um, making breakfast for their families and, and buying food for breakfast would want to make their kids smarter by eating a big breakfast. Many years ago, our client was the beachy net packing company. We made a research and found out that the American public ate very light breakfasts of coffee, maybe a roll, and orange juice. We went to our physician, found that a heavy breakfast was sounder from the standpoint of health than a light breakfast because the body loses energy during the night and needs it during the day. We asked the physician, after telling him why we were talking to him, would he be willing at no cost to write to 5,000 physicians and ask them whether their judgment uh, was the same as his, confirmed his judgment. He said he would be glad to do it. We carried out a letter to 5,000 physicians. Obviously, all of them concurred that a heavy breakfast was better for the health of the American people than a light breakfast. That was publicized in the newspapers. Newspapers throughout the country 
had headlines saying 4,500 physicians urge heavy breakfast in order to improve health of American people. Many of them stated that bacon and eggs should be embodied with the breakfast, and as a result, the sale of bacon went up, and I still have a letter from Bartlett Arkell, president of Beach Nut Packing Company, telling me so. So I think here we can review what these lessons are for <clears throat> boosting a client's reputation, according to Edward Bernays. One was to use research. He was the first one um, in the early 20s to go out and um, in, in that case with Dr. Brill, a famous psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst at the time. So let's review the lessons about reputation management according to Edward Bernays. One, not to use a brand name because it will be too promotional. Two, to attach a consumer product to a greater social cause. So we've seen bacon becomes a health product. Soap becomes a creativity booster for children. Cigarettes become a way to show that you're a liberated woman, right? It, and he never would talk about the benefits of using those products and especially those brands at all. The product probably had nothing to do with the campaign. It was really the association that made the campaign so powerful. It was the association with greater health for your family, with a greater social status and liberation, of course, and um, children's creativity. What family does not want their children to become creative? And if ivory soap, soap can make it so, then let's go and buy ivory soap. Um, he, by doing so, he inevitably achieved greater trust for the brand and for even without talking about the brand name, he would let the advertising people talk about the brand name. And, but he, in his role as a public relations counselor, never spoke about the brand name because he knew that that would ruin the credibility. And speaking of credibility, he always used as spokespeople, as authorities, doctors, right, or psychologists to talk about the, um, the positive impact of, of these products. And, you know, this is something that we use, uh, you know, we've been using throughout our, our whole careers is the, the authority association or figure that's going to lend credibility to the campaign. Um, he was the first to use research. Now, coming from uh, the family that he did, research was a very important part of uh, psychoanalysis that his uncle Freud used. And now here, Bernays is taking it for the first time and bringing it into the public relations profession. So by tying these products into greater social good, he creates trust for the brands. He creates a good feeling between uh, the shopper and the major corporations that produce these brands. And again, he is not taking credit for anything. He never issues a press release. He just creates news and news in a positive way that will build up the reputation for these clients that he represented. Never once talking about the absolute direct benefits of using these products. I'd like to end by reading to you what Bernays' original definition of public relations was. He said, a public relations person is an applied social scientist who advises a client or employer on the social attitudes and actions to take to win the support of the publics upon whom his or her viability depends. Now that is a very high level way to look at the public relations field. And I'm sure, you know, in these days of social media, very few students are taught that this is what this field originally was all about. Um, one of our goals at the Museum of Public Relations is to bring these concepts back, uh, to bring uh, students back to understand the depth 
of this field and that it is indeed an applied social science. And I think that students will have a much richer career in knowing that the roots of public relations were coming from the social sciences and not being dictated by the needs of uh, a Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, et cetera. So it's a, a bigger field than a more important field than I think it is being uh, seen as today. And um, I do hope at some point, if any of you are in New York, you will take the time to stop up and see the museum in person. If not, in many months from now, we will have our 2,500 artifacts digitized. So now the world can, can experience these artifacts, many of which are over hundred years old. Um, they're really truly a great way to bring this field to life and to keep its history alive for the next generations. Thank you very much. Thank you.